And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, as always, I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. <clears throat> Strap in, boys, we've got a long one. So Phrasing. Yes, phrasing. A long one, but not necessarily a hard one. That does not count as phrasing. That was intentional. I know. It is quite girthy, though. Okay, that's phrasing. <laughs> and it was intentional as well, so no. <laughs> but we are we are ha we have we have managed to somehow finish the class the class entries and found every single one of them to be an absolute banger i want to play one and i don't know which one i want to play first i'm stuck <laughs> help me this choice paralysis is torture if you listen close you can hear somebody who ru who runs hero system laughing at your choice paralysis and then crying because fuck they... them play rifts assholes <laughs> I've done Fuck. it. I've played Rifts with all of the 30 fucking books or something. I think there's a whole lot more than that, but still, fuck you. <laughs> Choice paralysis, most like nightmares. Mm -hmm. These rules don't fit in this hole. No, everything's a square hole, and everything's a round peg. Strike that. Reverse it. Everything's a square peg, and everything's a round hole. Yeah, and it does. It doesn't help that it doesn't help that you need to do a bunch of bookmarks yourself because they're because the because of um, Palladium Games' unique form of editing. <laughs> Indices. What are those? Yeah, for anyone who ever, for anyone who ever gets annoyed at the at the fact that I keep bitching about bookmarks and indices, you can blame Palladium for that. And I am not going to stop bitching about that until, until they until they get the hint. Which, because of how stub because of how stubborn Kevin Ciambeta is, might be a while. But hey, at the at the very at the very least, these days you can play a Macross game without having to use his system. So, kudos on that. But. This, but for this particular week, we are covering items and equipment, which means we have to handle um, personal effects, which we'll get in, which we'll get into. Items and ki items and kits, weapons and armor, weapons and armor kits, potions, and magical items. This also means that when it came to the, when it came to the when it came to the overview back and forth that I do with Tanner each each week that we do this, there was a lot more text, to the point that he had to take a break because his fingers were getting tired. It doesn't exactly help that th that um that Murf that Murphy's Law was going about, but at this point Murphy and us are drinking buddies. <laughs> I. I'd say I'd say so, and I'm pretty sure every, I'm pretty sure every programmer on the planet is is out there dr is out there drinking on a Friday night. You make me want to go grab my whiskey, because I'm not even a professional programmer. But yes, <laughs> just re just remember the programmer's drinking song. Ninety nine little bugs in the code. Ninety nine bugs in the code. You take one down, you patch it around. One hundred eight little bugs in the code. Yes. Mm. You have no idea how accurate that song actually is. Oh, I do. <laughs> it's my fa my favorite meme about programming is programmers code doesn't work. I have no idea why it's not working. Pro programmers code suddenly works. I have no idea why it's working. That's fairly accurate. Um, but for the, but for the start for the starting part of it, we're going to be we're going to be covering um, the we're going to be covering this in four in essentially five 
sections. And some of these we're probably going to be covering faster than others, but um, item, but items, kits, weapons and armor, potions and consumables, and magic items. And before we, before we get to the items and kits part of this, I want to. I I want I I think it's time that you delve into the delve into the accent part of the show. Yes, it is a staple of this particular series, of <laughs> this particular Valley of the Judge series, because it seems like every section we come upon has some person within the world of Mirari saying something that is apropos to the section, and so we begin. Preparation is salvation out there in the wilds. You have to be prepared. At least that's what I keep trying to communicate to all your fledgling adventurers as you rush out to kill your first goblin incursion or whatever. You're not going to get very far if you don't know where you're going. Or if you don't have enough food to get there. I don't know why they seem... But it seems like this generation is all action, but no thought. They don't want to think about all the stuff that goes into an adventure. They just want to adventure. It's no wonder why we got record adventurer deaths these days. But that stuff is heavy. They complain, but it's necessary. I always try to respond. For instance, you might be able to climb pretty well, but that doesn't mean that everyone in your group is going to be able to do that. Oftentimes, those wizard folk got spindly little climbing arms and don't have the strength to carry the supplies that will actually help them climb. You gotta know that stuff because you're going to need that wizard to burn them little goblin husks to bits for you, and that's going to be a lot harder for you to do if you're burning them at the bottom of the climb. Anyways, you should always prepare for a trip. Make sure you got, yes, weapons and armor, but also the other gear you need. Like so many adventurers nowadays forget to bring a harvester's kit, which is just baffling to me. What if there's a troll eating them goblin pukes? Are you serious you're going to leave valuable troll blood there to spoil just because you couldn't be bothered to bring the equipment to harvest it while it's fresh? That's like throwing gold out the window or giving it to barbarians. Stuff like that kills me inside a little bit. Sorry, got the rambling again. The point is this. Know where you're going, and make sure you have what you need to get there. Gorm, honorable guide of Mat Illo. So, yeah, we're going to be covering items, and when and when it comes to the when it comes to those items, you need you need you obviously need gear. And now the. I'm not going to go through the first few, for the first few paragraphs of this because because it's going to be because it's going to be stuff that we've kind of dipped into um here here and there up until this point but now now's the time where we actually go all in with it. And I will I will note that he that in the that early on he notes the system aims to limit the bookkeeping of many tabletop RPGs while still addressing the idea that it pays to be prepared. Each kit weighs down a, to a, a character's total encumbrance, as do weapons and armor, so a player will need to decide which sets of items are important to their characters. I will freely admit that I am not a fan of a lot of games' inventory systems. And the big reason for that is a lot of it is, bu is um, bookkeeping. Or or doesn't fit the kind of game that it that it's supposed to. Now, if you're dealing if you're dealing with a with your if you're dealing with epic tier kind of characters, it's kind it's kind of odd to ha it's kind of odd to have them track e to have them track every single thing in their pack. That's why it doesn't surprise me that I've seen more and more games try and um try try and try and try and start try and go take a more narrative spin on things i'd say one of the big one of the big um pushers for this kind of thing is things like the black hack or five torches deep mm -hmm. oh now when it comes to uh, also the also you have you have to occasionally deal with the G, with the gm that likes to go with that likes to go with the monty hall approach don't do the monty hall approach but I'd like to open with what Tanner had sent had sent me in response to my question on on items and kits, since that's what we're going to be starting. And and actually, actually, I'll take I take it back. The first thing we're going to be starting is with personal effects, which he open which before I get into the dev note, I 
I want to go over what he had what he had said, saying, "This was a mechanic I actually created after making the kits, and I implemented it for two very different reasons. First, I wanted to force players to think about their characters just a little bit more. I'm not the type who wants pages of backstory or anything like that. In fact, I insist new <coughs> players write one single sentence describing their character, which must contain a reason for being as well as a general pres prescription for action." but not be too specific, and as they played, they developed this backstory in order to fit with the world events. That's actually a bit, That's actually not a bad idea. But personal effects force a little bit of individuality into each character. Players don't even need to know why they have each personal effect. Choosing them randomly works just as well, but because they have them, players start to create reasons why they have them as they experience the game. Maybe they randomly put the finger bone of a saint as a personal effect, and seeing some of the churches slash temples gives some flavor slash backstory to that item. Things like this, for me, make characters more interesting, which is important since it makes them more fun to play with. The other reason p for personal effects is the kits. Some people just want to have random things like a rope, or a bag of chalk, or something oddly specific without having a specific kit. Personal effects allow for that, and more importantly, they don't count against encumbrance. So a character is allowed their flavor without it impacting the game. With that said, there are rules for personal effects and the like. No BS magical shite or something that is obviously gaming the system, like a 4,000 pound rock or whatever. But the people who want that are generally just trying to be that guy, so this one is easy to nip in the bud with GM Fiat. Um, that whole, that whole, that whole single sentence thing, I find, I find that interesting because... It reminds me of Cypher System. Yeah. Because let, let's be honest, a lot of times when people come up with backgrounds, and this is something that Cypher System tries tries to address as well, people come up with their backgrounds independent of each other. And the there are other there are other games that um that work around that too. Uh Ten Raban Show, you're you're meant to, to have karma with it, with characters in the party mm -hmm. as well. They, that's actually part of your goals and, and karma system. Um, so, I, I think the the whole single sentence as a thesis statement of your character and then allow it to grow organically during the campaign um, is a very unique... Like, I, I don't see it very often. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's a unique flavor to a way to make a party organically integrate with both the world and each other. There's there's also the fact that let's let's be honest, we've had we've had that one person who does the long long ass backstory as if they're writing a biography with themselves as the protagonist. Ah, uh, self insert fanfic. It's fantastic. Also known as being a Hollywood writer. Was pun intended. <laughs> but when, now when it com now obvious a big um a big push in the last few years has been for has been for a session zero but I feel like session I feel like just encouraging session zeros doesn't go far enough largely because there's no incentive to do so especially for and I will I will admit this is, there's an arguable amount of hypocrisy because in a lot of the get a lot of the games that that I've run I tend to handle character creation with each person individually instead instead of instead of that group setup so is that is, it, go ahead I was gonna say is that is that more due to circumstances of scheduling or what sometimes it's due to scheduling other times it's the fact that I is the fact that I have to guide someone into a system that they're not all that familiar with. And in some in some cases, um some you know how we've joked about choice paralysis? Um some people have that some people have that issue when it comes to what you, what your backstory is going to be when you have when you have such a wide sandbox to mess around in. I understand that. Um Especially the the one about easing specific people into a system they've never encountered or, or are familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, however, I I feel that that particular point is a little misguided, if only because of the fact that even if you've got veterans who are 
familiar with the system you're playing, the fact that you're there helping someone who's new to the system can sort of as a as a as a an example a leading by example um have they them chime in as well you you start getting table interaction between players at a session zero if you do things in that group setting that that helps to build a foundation for more table interaction um so i've always tried to hold group session zeros it's not always easy um, again, scheduling is usually the worst part there. Sometimes people are just like, I can't make it to session zero. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I'll keep notes of what everybody else does, and we'll work with you within those within those constraints because I don't like to have things wholly disconnected. Although I should note, um, the Fatum deck that that I that I bought a while back has made has made <laughs> things equally in, equally interesting and equally chaotic. Um, same thing goes for the Fortune deck for Everway. Even if I'm not running an Everway game, um, sometimes sometimes I'll have pe I'll have people I'll have people draw a set of, a set of cards from from that and see and see how they interpret what they get. Yeah, it's been both have been pretty fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, personal effects. Now we open up with a dev note saying. The idea of having kits rather than tracking individual items might, might seem alien to some people, especially to those whose carrying capacities are relatively low. Players might complain that they complain that they only wish to carry a rope without needing to be encumbered by an entire explorer's kit. A character's personal effects handle this issue. So at character creation, you ch you choose three items to act as a character's personal effects. A character, unless robbed, stripped, or otherwise deprived, is always considered to have these items and they do not count towards that character's total carrying capacity. A player should not choose weapons, armor, shields, or any item that would grant explicit mechanical bonuses beyond that which is already offered in the kits. A character's personal effects are meant to add flavor to that character and allow them to use that flavor in a creative way, rather than granting static bonus boosts to skills and abilities. For example, a character might have their trusty rope, or a small, perfectly spherical stone weighing two pounds, and a signet ring from their great-grandfather as their personal effects. Or one might have a bag of chalk, a torch that never seems to run out of oil, and a compass that doesn't point north. Like the items in the kits, a character does not run out of the items in their personal effects. They are always considered to have them, unless explicitly stolen. If the items are lost or stolen, a character may gain them back during a long rest, as long as it would make narrative sense to do so or may gain experience when they regain them in the case of in the case of having to go on an adventure to find them um there is there is an in, there is an interesting question in the in the um comments on on one part of it where Aaron where um Aaron asks to what degree can the items chosen in personal effects be magical a torch that cannot run out of oil seems pretty minor but could i have a stone that can speak certain phrases and Tanner's response was, So the main requirement I'm thinking is that the effects should only ever be flavorful, or maybe they provide a mechanical boost only in key scenes, so very rarely. Um, let me let me expand it. For example, the one thing that's not allowed in the rules as, the, as they are right now is Jack Sparrow's pistol with only one shot. Something like that needs to be an option because it's too perfect not to be, and in my opinion... It should provide a bonus when it's shot because its shot is meaningful and a one-time thing and the weight of that shot adds gravity to various scenes. But the purpose of the mechanic is to give weight and character to characters rather than give them boosts. The trick is just the wording. Uh, I would th in in certain in certain games I've talked about I've talked about the importance of providing proper examples. And my gold standard for this once again is 13th age and the example is given for the one unique thing. Now, what is the one unique thing? It's exactly what it says on the tin. It is a one unique thing that the that the character has. There's a two-page spread in the core book for 13th age that goes over example uh, example ideas for one unique things that are good examples, questionable examples, and no. 
And I do think that with personal effects, because of how wide of a net the possibility of personal effects are, some general do's and don'ts should be, at the very least, considered. I didn't lose you, did I, Zan? No, I'm still... A character may choose a weapon as a personal effect if they count the weapon's encumbrance or if they do not wish to count the weapon's encumbrance. Have the weapon... ...be faulty or ornamental in some way. A ceremonial dagger that is not made for combat makes for a wonderful personal effect. In cases of extreme stress, such as when a character raises the death flag, GMs are encouraged to allow for these personal effect weapons, even if they were once ornamental slash defunct, to be used as regular weapons. Personal effects should add flavor to a scene rather than detract from it. They are subject to GM approval and should fit the setting of the world. Unlike other mechanical systems in Heavens and Heresies, personal effects are left more open to encourage creativity, but this openness does not mean players are free to break the game. A rock weighing two tons is not a viable personal effect, even if the above rules state that personal effects do not count against the character's carrying capacity as it breaks the continuity of the game world. In creating a personal effect, players should think of items that are fun not only for them, but for the rest of the table as well, GM included. Um, I, know I, I know I said the the possibility of, um, of good and bad examples in a do's and don'ts list. Um, I'd, also con I'd also consider as maybe an appendix thing Putting in a random ch a random chart of, of potential personal effects for those who need a bit of a push. You know, like a, D a D100 chart for random personal effects? Mm -hmm. or Or the D666 charts that, um, so, that so many Japanese tabletop games love? And yes, I'm mainly bringing up, ma I'm mainly bringing up Made and some of the interesting items that are that were in some of those random charts mm -hmm. <laughs> including a Ryuki reference <laughs> <laughs> because you could you could roll and get a survive card true <laughs> oh but yeah I'm per I'm perfectly fine with with per aside from that I'm, I'm fine with the idea of personal effects it's just I think I think I think a little bit of guidance is necessary. And um, as as a uh, as an example of guidances, I actually have the uh, one unique thing examples open from thirteenth page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have f five different categories. There's uh, and these categories are are how you can expect the one unique thing to act. The the absolute no was de call, they call it deliberately pushing it. Uh, and the example is, I am the only elf dwarf person in the world who can fly. <laughs> um, too much for first level, which was things like I am a dragon rider, or I am the reincarnation of a previous very powerful person here. And I remember everything. Then there was seemingly innocuous things like I'm the only elf in the world with human years, or I am an elven pyromaniac. <laughs> Which, when you consider that in most settings, elves like trees is not a good thing for an elf to be. Then there's a on the other side of, I guess what you would call pushing it, players creating the story. Uh, uniques that would change the actual setting pretty severely. Uh, I think the best example here was, I am the only human child of a zombie mother. And the comment from the GM was, uh, this is the type of big picture unique that a GM can hang an entire campaign on, and he did for a while, since the prophecies concerning this character seemed to be forcing at least three of the villainous icons to accelerate their timetables of destruction. So th this is this is the other side of things that would probably not fit Heavens and Heresies. Um, 
it's probably you'd want it to lie in the seemingly innocuous section of things. You know, small things that have a, a weight to them in specific examples, but other than that, nothing too major. Because uh, cool ideas, consequences later... I think the coolest one was um, someone had had their eyes put out unjustly in the Elven Court, so the Elven Queen replaced their eyes with opals. But that's again, that's a little too, that's that's a little too more, uh, a little more narratively specific than what these personal effects are implied to be. Um, Jack Sparrow's pistol being considered a personal effect. I think I think um looking at the with respect to weapons and when raising the death flag resolve the situation in one direction or another. It may not be a good direction. You never know. But I think that actually could cover the Jack Sparrow's gun. Um, example from that sidebar note. Mm -hmm. Now, so ultimately, oh, I was going to so so ultimately, um, personal effects, little things, little things that you think will be cool for your character to have that aren't you know, they aren't too big. Mm -hmm. And there's no shortage of ran of random tables for th for the equip for their equivalent. I mean, heck, you could say a feather from a hawk, um, a really cool skipping stone you found at a, at a uh, river that you always seem to find whenever you skip it. Mm -hmm. Your lucky skipping stone. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Tiny stuff. Uh, now next we have raw ma raw materials, which. Again, that which is going to be something that we that I have to I have to I have to kind of go into. Let me see if I can. Oh, um, ah, uh, this one this one isn't as long as long as the other. But with raw materials, he had said this was a way for me to tie in rewards to into the mechanical progress of the game and the narrative. It allowed for a GM to give customized loot that had history with the players in a way that was simple to create and distribute. It also made a way for the GM to not have to put a bunch of bandits on the road just so he could have a way to give the party gold slash spending money. Now, every encounter will give you currency to spend, and the quality of that currency is tied to the encounter in the same commons through legendary system. It's super simple to utilize and leads to some really cool loot. And then he, get, he gave an example, but I'm I'm going to I'm going to cover that in a we'll cover that in a minute. So, with raw with raw materials, we're not using money in the traditional sense. Instead, we rank, re rank rewards, often called materials or currency by tier: common, uncommon, rare, very rare, and legendary. A bag of silver may be a reward from the local mayor, but it is evaluated in the game as a tier <laughs> one common material. So materials are organized in the in the following manner: um, the origin, the name, the materials' resonance, and the materials' quality. So the first is the origin slash name, <laughs> which is relatively self-explanatory. Um, and it says unless the materials slash currency are worn freely, such as a bag of gold held held by a group of bandits, someone in the in the party must be holding a harvester's kit in order to harvest materials from creatures and resource nodes. 
and a, yep. mat a material's origin should not have a lengthy description and should be summarized in a few words. For example, mithril harvested from a metal deposit deep within an ancient volcano would have mithril or ore as its name, while a player might harvest a dragon scale from a slain dragon. Both the material's resonance and its quality also help it to describe it, and so, and so its origin should be kept simple for simplicity's sake. Let's see, then we I mean, have... If, if it were mithril from a metal deposit deep within an ancient volcano, it should just be mithril ore. There you go. Because mm -hmm. it's certainly not an ingot. Oh. Mm -hmm. So then we have resonance, which is determined by its uh, magical affinity. Resonance is the descriptor which def which refers to the core fe the core feature which defines the material, and there are six resonances. Each is affiliated with with um, certain mat certain creatures or material, and can have secondary resonances. So psychic is affiliated with creatures or materials that charm, confuse, deal psychic damage, or otherwise manipulate the mind, and has secondary resources of enthrall, madness, and enlightened. Um, elemental is associated is affiliated with um, dealing elemental damage or affiliated with one of the listed elements and secondary resources are acid aether fire uh, earth fire ice lightning poison and wind thunder somatic is has a bil associated with abilities that manipulate the body in some way either through crippling afflictions or healing rejuvenations and ha and has secondary resources rejuvenation wither or weird resonances monk Le secondary resonances yeah resonances so sorry <laughs> it's okay um light slash darkness has abilities which manipulate light darkness or hide or reveal other creatures and of course the secondary resonances are light and darkness rift has other has other planar abilities or abilities which allow it to teleport and of course secondary re resonance is rift and fate has abilities which predict or manipulate future outcomes secondary resources well fate yeah the secondary resonances seem to be named after spells mm -hmm. and uh, if i'm looking at this correctly and uh, <laughs> uh when i look at fate i i the only thing i can i can uh, i can think of monk um, well, no, now there's two things I can think of. The first one was that was going to be, um, loaded dice. Um, and it, when it comes to the, it does explain. Explain the secondary resource part about how they correspond to various spell categories and some crafting recipes require material to have a specific secondary resonance. So I know I keep saying resource instead of resonance. It the in the font the font can make them look very similar. He's just blind. Well, I was. <laughs> he got better though. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a bit on retur on determining resource about how about how for. And it's a simple process for the GM and for the adventurer, though of course the GM has final say. Oh, much, much, much of the time, materials will be harvested from creatures, and you can you can determine what resonance the material has by looking at a creature's stats, and the and can check if the creature can naturally deal any of the damage types. If you can deal poison damage, for example, then the material. Those harvested from it will have the elemental resonance with the poison secondary, or if it or if it uses features that confound the mind and deal psychic damage, it will have the psychic resonance with the madness secondary. Is determ the resonances are determined the same way as it would be for the creature? First, the challenge rating is it. determined ranging from common to legendary of the, of the area and the creatures in it an area filled with magically potent monsters is sure to bear magically potent flora and materials as well determining the cr will determine the rarity of the harvested materials then they may assign those materials a resonance that fits the theme of the surrounding area 
Mithril harvested from the cold northern mountains might have the elemental cold resonance, whereas mit Mithril harvested from a, from a deep volcano deep within a volcano's core might have the elemental fire resonance. An herb harvested in the bog of a swamp might have the elemental acid resonance, while one harvested deep within a forest might have the elemental poison resonance. Side note, the differences between swamps and marshes are that one is acidic and the other is uh, is basic. Mm -hmm. So um, just remember, if you're in a marsh, you're a basic bitch. <laughs> Though only one of a material's resonances may be used in a crafting recipe, harvested materials may can have multiple resonances. If a creature naturally deals both cold and fire damage, for example, the materials harvested it from it would have the elemental resonance with both fire and ice as its secondary resonances. Creatures that deal physical damage as their primary as their primary damage source yield the primal earth resonance, and most currency of the in the game is of the primal earth resonance. Gold is commonly used as trade material because of the richness of the primal earth resonance within it from the same material. So, uh, something's not in that table. Either primal was a previous name for elemental, or primal is a special type of resonance that we haven't been able to... discuss hey tanner it looks like we have our first need for clarification i'd i'm leaning towards that i'm leaning towards it originally was primal and then changed to elemental i i know i'm just mm -hmm. clarification is always nice yes uh now when it comes to rarity that's determined from the ferocity and power of the monster from which it was gathered the bones and scales of an ancient red dragon are far stronger and far more magically potent than the bones of a goblin. The difference... I should hope so. <laughs> yes. The difference... I mean, there is a one exception, but Pun Pun doesn't exist in this world. Mm -hmm. um, this difference in durability and in dairy rarity materials. Um... You know, I have to say, Monk, um, under this particular... loot system, I would guarantee that Goblin Slayer is richer than anyone else in the border town. Considering how many goblins he's killed. <laughs> that many that many common materials is just going to add up. Come on now. No, it, prob <laughs> it probably is, but because but because of the fact that that's all that he t that's all that he tackles, that that's why he's just a he's just a silver rank. Mm-hmm. But the word goblins turns him on like nothing else. <laughs> he becomes murderously delicious. Oh. And then we get to harvesting materials from monsters and resource nodes. When a monster is slain or a resource node is found, players can harvest them. The GM determines which type of re materials are appropriate for any given monster or resource node, and the amount of crafting materials gained is based on the size of what is being harvested. And I, he put this in bold. The number of materials players may harvest from a creature or resource node is dependent on the difficulty of that particular encounter or area within its particular tier. And it, there's a reference to the GM's toolkit for more details. While this might seem like a metagame mechanic, it fits into the narrative fluidly. The largest deposits of resources are often the most heavily guarded or the most difficult to reach, otherwise they would have already been harvested. So the so when it comes to the difficulty inconsequential, you're not getting anything. Whereas nigh impossible, the highest tier, you're gonna have four harvested materials. Which looking at what materials are used for, and we'll get into some of that later, um, is actually quite a lot of materials. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Especially if that's four for every person in the party. That's a lot of materials. Let's see, there's an asterisk about the the number of harvested materials one gets from an encounter is measured before things like terrain advantage are calculated into the encounter. 
and DevNote. Though the names are different, the relative difficulty still works on the five-tier scale, as do most things in Heavens and Heresies. And then we have Materials and Encumbrance. Materials can vary in terms of encumbrance, but raw materials, materials that are harvested directly from their source, usually have an encumbrance of two or three before they are refined. To refine a material, one must be in a city and have access to the proper equipment that would allow for materials refinement. Tanning racks for pelts and furs, smithies for unrefined ore, etc. Refining materials generally only costs time, as described in Time and Introduction and Core Rules, which we already went through. When one refines a material, its encumbrance decreases by half, rounded up or down based on what makes narrative sense. Most refined materials have an encumbrance of one, but heavier materials, say the pelt of a bear, might have an encumbrance of two, even when refined. Dev note: Refining materials is one of the things that is on the time list in the introduction. It's one of the activities that takes up a segment of time, meaning how much time it takes is already determined into the system of the game. And then we have a few, um, a few sample material, a few sample materials. And I hope this is set up in a table instead of, the, instead of the way it is currently later on. So a troll heart is a ra is is rare quality, and has the somatic primary and life secondary resonances and two encumbrance. A yep. a bear pelt is an uncommon material that has the elemental and earth resonances and an encumbrance of three. The bag of the bag of silver from the mayor is a com is common elemental earth and one. Um, although this does this does ask the big question what would what would it what would what would the um what would the encum what would the encumbrance be if you were to say um, ro take a take a chest full take a chest full of Scrooge McDuck's money. You know, monk. Considering that he can swim through that money like it's liquid, there's magic to it. So I'm <laughs> I'm guessing it's going to be very rare at the very least. Probably. <laughs> It'll be elemental earth because it's you know golden gems and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if it's a full chest. Probably encumbrance three. Gold's heavy. Yes, it is. And then we get to adventuring kits, and there's a big ass di there's a there's a big ass set of notes. Uh, but before that, I w I want to go into what he what he had said on on um, kits and okay. a bit and a bit of and a bit of encumbrance thing. I know this might be controversial, but I'm a big fan of encumbrance in TTRPGs, with a whole lot of caveats. The biggest caveat is that the encumbrance system needs to create an environment where choices matter, but since this is a game, they, they also need to not bog down the gameplay, but rather add to it. Item systems and encumbrance can add a lot to a game. Tough decisions about what to bring you, with you slash leave behind, firm rules to balance shenanigans silliness that oftentimes leaves the world inconsistent, mechanical balance to different stats, etc. All of these reasons are why I have an encumbrance system and why I tend to prefer games with them. That said, I don't like how a lot of games do encumbrance systems. Measuring what you can carry in pounds makes no fucking sense. When I go backpacking, my pack weighs about 45 pounds and it's easy enough to carry 10 plus miles in a day, but my 45 pound kayak is a nightmare to carry one mile. The point is that size and shape matter in terms of how easy a thing to carry. Compact backpacking pack with weight distribution spread evenly over the hips and a little over the shoulders? Easy. A kayak carried by a strap over the shoulder? Nightmare. Th which is why I run the encumbrance system like I do, as abstracted numbers. An item's encumbrance, the number assigned to it, is based on the item's size and weight. If something is large and unwieldy, it has a higher encumbrance even if it is relatively light while heavier items could have less encumbrance if they are weighted in a way that makes them easier to carry. This all combines together with a system that is hyper-streamlined and easy to track, and so does not get in the way of the game like a lot of other encumbrance systems do. For example, your carrying capacity is equal to your strength score plus your constitution modifier. 
Boom. Done. No multiplying by four and adding your whatever to get the amount of pounds you can carry and then counting all of the pounds of what you're carrying. In this system, most things can be handled, most things that can be carried, sorry, have an encumbrance of one through six, so you're never really doing big maths with those numbers. Kits, which we're about to get to, address a different problem I've seen in a lot of games. Most people have no idea what they would need to bring in a survival situation, and that's not their fault. Most people have no idea how much food and water you should bring when you are backpacking. Again, that's totally fine. And most people have no idea all the little add-ons that go into rock climbing. So when it comes to game design, why would a game assume that they do? A lot of time, necessary items exist as, a, as the way for the GM to be a dick. Oh, you didn't purchase the magical water filter from the item stop. Now you have Giardia. Or other s silliness. I wanted a system that was, cl that was clear to players. You need this for X situation. For example, the survival kit is assumed to have in it all the extra things, minus food and water, that you might need to travel into the wilderness, and th these items are, by design, nebulous. That might seem alien to folks, but I've never come across, really come across a problem with it in playtesting. Most of the time, it's something like, can I go fishing? You have your, sur your survivalist kit, don't you? Yep. Then yes, take some twine and, and a hook from your pack, find some grubs in the nearby bush fishes and begin to fish in the lake. This doesn't mean that that without kits players are screwed however. I don't have a survival kit but I do have my spear. I attempt to go spear fishing in the lake is a perfectly viable answer though it might be more dangerous slash exhausting slash difficult without the appropriate kit. This is a role playing game and role playing games are about rewarding lateral thinking. And uh I'm glad he likes encumbrance systems and all, but I'd like to point to the hundreds of thousands of people that have gamed not just TTRPGs, but actual video games as well, that have encumbrance systems in their favor to the point where encumbrance doesn't matter. Uh, most famous of these is probably all of the alchemy and enchanting tricks in the Elder Scrolls game that allow you to get a ludus ludicrous... A ludicrously high encumbrance uh, level so that you can just carry all your loot with you everywhere. Um, of, of course, the Elder Scrolls game seemed to encourage this with the amount of pack ratness in, the, in its design. Yes. In Skyrim, you are you are, uh, you are are the world's largest kleptomaniac. You are not the Dragonborn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> you're also the world's biggest druggie because the best way to... Uh, <laughs> to raise alchemy is to eat every reagent you come across and suffer or benefit from them as necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so you're sitting you're going around eating all of the hallucinogenic plants. I'm gonna trip balls, but maybe it'll make me stronger. Pro tip, it just makes you crazier. That's a, that's a one-way trip to being a Malkavian. It's a one-way trip to being Florida, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> Next thing you know, you're talking about, have you ever had gator meat? I have had gator meat. It's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but he, now, some of that, we, some of that is already, is, is kind of, is kind of covered in the dev note. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm of I'm personally of the mindset that when it comes to in, when it comes to encumbrance, the idea of putting in an encumbrance system is not the problem. The problem is a lot of people don't know how to execute it, or the, or the, or the, or it's designed by people who are high on the simulation attitude. Because let's not forget a lot of er, a lot of early tabletop conventions started started out in college rooms. With co with college style gamers, i.e., know it alls. Okay, that's a little bit that's a little bit harsh, but the point but the point is, there's a lot there's a lot of um a lot of old school a lot of old school gamers who have a massive hard on for simulationism. I uh I'm I'm 
going to be honest. When it comes to encumbrance systems, um, I've been spoiled for too long by... Uh, everything takes one slot, and you can have 99 of that in each slot, and you have infinite slots. Thank you, Final Fantasy VI. Thank you, Nier Automata. Thank you, uh, every Super Robot Wars game ever. I like that system, because that system just more fun to me. But everybody has preferences. That's why we, that's why we explore them. Mm-hmm. And person, personally, I've, I've always been of the mindset of I think people would wouldn't mind wouldn't mind encumbrance if it if it weren't for if it weren't for how um how it fe- how it feels like you're itemizing your tax report your tax re- your tax return with some games. <laughs> even games that I li- even games that I like are not immune to this, and I'd like I think it's because of people of people um of people following a tradition f- for its own sake instead of asking why. Mm-hmm. So when it com- so when it comes to the included within them, they are assumed to have all the items that would be necessary for fulfilling their specific task, but can. which can be used to achieve effects that are not intended by the kit itself. Uh, but he says eventually he'll have the descriptions written out better and provide a more representative list, though these are not supposed to be a hardened set of things, but more nebulous and setting slash GM slash player dependent. Also, um, also these are initial musings. He'll be streamlining adding and adding additional kits later. Um, the only other game I can think of that's done this whole kit-ish issue at at this level of detail um i know some people mi- some people might cry foul about this but it's not D 5e that's done that's done it well it's fantasy craft yeah their their kits are pretty nice mm-hmm. so we so the ones that we have so far are the explorers kit the survivors kit the chroniclers kit the bounty hunters kit the navigators kit <laughs> there's the special one that says don't pick it because there's not because it doesn't have anything. Mm-hmm. A skullduggery kit, a harvester's kit, and a healer's kit. So someone's always going to need a harvester's kit. We've, we've we've already seen that with the materials section. Yeah, you have to have it. Let's see the explorer the the explorer's kit um, also has some rules for for what torches can do. Um, yep. But I think let's see the har the harvester's kit. Well, it lets you lets you harvest rare lets you harvest rare ma- rare materials. Um, the navigator's kit. <laughs> I have to read this. You were warned. You need to put this back right now. It doesn't actually do anything. It just sits there in your inventory, like your other items used to do. But you need that space now. Oh. And these the skullduggery kit. Which basically <laughs> it lets you be a thief. Mm-hmm. It's your it's your thief tools yep. by any other name. Let's see the survivor's kit, which um has a, some it has a list of what of what it has. Um the chronicler's kit, so, same the bounty hunter's kit and the healer's kit. When you have this when you have this kit in your inventory, you heal for one Additional hit hit points during you may also give the benefits of this kit to another creature, but the benefits of a healer's kit may only be applied to one creature each time you push forward, and the events of a healer's kit do not stack with itself. In addition, you may use your action to purge the bleeding condition from yourself or another creature within melee reach of you, even if you do not have proficiency in the nature skill. Um... With that, with that, um, with the adventuring kit table that I'm seeing here, I think I think something that could be done to help to help reform that to help um to help better establish an identity for it is to put in two things. One, the associated the associated skills that it, that it that that kind of kit might use, and two, um. What other what other effects you can have with this kit when you have it in your when you have it in your inventory? 
Oh. Like for I and po possibly um possibly what possibly the diff um better illustrate the difference of what you could do what you can do with the kit and what you could do without it. Since kits are go kits are going to it's very clear that kits are going to be an important factor in the game. So I think that's something th to make more clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can see that that need. So then we get to weapons and armor. <laughs> ah yes. It's uh it's accent time number 2. And um but before you bef actually actually we'll do we'll do the accent and and <clears throat> then and then I'll go into what Tanner had to say, had to say on this. All right. Now you see, armor tells a story, mate. Don't matter the look, the wear, the age. It tells a story, and there ain't a single one, not one story that ain't extra interesting in its own way. You see that noble over there, with the shine and steel and the winning smile? Yeah, even his tells a story. Expertly designed for movement. Maybe he'll use it, maybe he won't. Hours upon hours of sweat and blood poured into that shine. Unused until now, but paid for by a family that used theirs. That armor has a lineage, just like the boy that wears it. Countless walls and his ancestors that won him, they made that armor possible. And look at the armor worn by his instructor, Elven Maid, sung from a great tree from the looks of it. Now some people might think that wood won't do you no good compared to steel. That ain't true, so I sing to connect themselves to the goddess and from that so song can forge just like any dwarf. Don't don't tell any dwarf I said so. Our dwarf would be perfectly content knowing that yes, even his songs sung from the earth are also considered. <laughs> the shape of that song is molded into the armor. See how it curves, moves, protects? See the edges worn and frayed. It has seen battle first hand. Many generations of battle by the looks of it. It fits him well, sure. But it's a little too wide in some arrows, too narrow in others. It wasn't made for him. For his father, maybe. Maybe his grandfather. Who's to say? Ama tells a story, mate. So what's yours? Tondin Axehead, honor guard of the Vargas family. And yes, arm armor should be personal. It is it is kind of amusing how, how a lot of people... How mon mundane equipment is so... It has been so de-incentivized when it sh if if you're de if when for all intents and purposes full plate should be as important as well power armor mostly because in the old days it was <laughs> full plate was not something that the normal person wore mm -hmm. it took a lot of materials to make full plate armor not just the metal but the time the other uh, pieces of uh, of material that went into it, the leather, the um, the padding from the jerkin, mm -hmm. was usually made from some sort of uh, of tough tough down. Um, also to keep you warm and somewhat dry, depending on the situation, depend and depending on the quality of the armor, mm -hmm. whether it had been cured with with certain fats of, or not, but. Most armor used in an age of sword and and shield was leather based, boiled or otherwise stiffened so that it was more resistant. Mm -hmm. Now, go, there is one thing that there is one thing that's brought up at the top. Armor is personal. It should be connected to the character that wears it, and it is for this reason that Heavens and Heresies categorizes armors into different types and tiers, but does not assign physical descriptions to specific suits of armor. There is no predefined plate or leather. This is left up to the individual character and their story. They might craft heavy armor from a hide or a light armor from steel. That is their prerogative. Players are tasked with adding life and character to their armor. 
Maybe their armor, maybe the armor was bought in a nondescript small village. That itself is a story, and the armor should have a story. Then we get to armor proficiency. Anyone can put on a suit of armor or strap a shield to an arm. Only those proficient in its use know how to wear it effectively. Various features grant you proficiency with certain types of armor. If you wear armor that you lack proficiency with, you gain none of the armor's defensive bonuses. So, Which makes sense, because if you're wearing an armor you're not proficient with, your movement's going to be bulky, sluggish, and, and dull. Mm -hmm. um, now, before, before, we get it, before we get into the stealth part and, the, and thus armor in general, I want to talk. I want to bring up what Tanner had said about weapons and armor because some parts of this I find very interesting. The pages I could write about weapons and armor in other games from the GM's perspective, I'll try not to do that. GM says the eleven-year-old at the public games night at the local GameStop. I want to. Ha I want to have a katana like Tanjiro, forged with special iron that makes the blade black, but there's only short sword, long sword, and great sword. The GM says. We could use the stats of the longsword for that, though you'd have to go on a quest to get the special line and make it special like Tanjiro's. The tired GM, repli GM replies. The player responds, But I don't want a longsword. I want a katana. I don't actually blame people for this crap. I blame the designers. They didn't create a system that defined weapons by classification. Their system defines weapons by individual weapons rather than the general weapon type, and then try to pretend that they did create a system based on general weapon type, but nobody believes them. It drove me crazy as a GM dealing with people's requests at public game night, which is why you see this system here. Weapons are divided into general categories, but are given flavor and description, as a fucking requirement I might add, by their players. The other thing that bothered me with weapons in other games is that they didn't feel different. The most they differed in 5e was damage. And while 3.5 has its problems, at least it had crit ranges and multipliers to, and something to make the rapier feel different from the great axe beyond the damage it dealt. So for Heavens and Heresies, each weapon takes a different physical defense, meaning having different weapons on you is a viable strategy. Boom, you're welcome, TTRPG community. And have different things that they do. Swords increase deflection, axes increase crit, mace pierce DR, every weapon is good in some situations and less effective by others by design. They all feel different, so not only do people have a reason for carrying a mace and an axe, increasing the desirability of strength as a stat since you need different loadouts, but how they'll be rewarded when they swing with an axe and it crits, or hit with a mace and it pierces DR. For armor, I had other issues, mostly, again, I wanted armor types to feel different and be differentiated by type rather than specific armor sets. Get on my level, WotC. <laughs> also, if you have six defensive stats, saves in 5e but defenses in Heavens and Heresies, why add a seventh in terms of AC? It's a little redundant, and it makes all types of armor, light, medium, and heavy, feel the same. My fix was simple. Since weapon targets a different defense... Armors need to increase survivability, but don't necessarily need to amplify defenses, since that would make them all feel the same. If I had it so that each amplified a different defense, which I don't. So instead, armors grant two of the following bonuses. Bonus HP, damage reduction, bonus deflection. Light armor grants DR and deflection. Medium armor gives HP and deflection. Heavy grants DR and HP. Boom. They feel different because each project each protects in a different way. And on top of that, they're tied to five tiers. Common, uncommon, rare, very rare, legendary. Just like every other thing in the game, because I'm awesome like that. <laughs> Currency, rituals, challenge rating for encounters, things you can buy, are all tied to the various tiers of play. Meaning that the types of rewards GMs should give, the types of encounters they should run, the types of abilities they can expect from players are all tied to the same systems. You are welcome, GMs, and by GMs I mean me. You are welcome, me. Seriously, though, this makes rewards, encounters, player expectations so much easier to manage. Did this? Did I mention this game started started as me running public games for ten plus people in Five E because the event coordinators assigned us the people that would be playing at our table? Monk, why does this sound like our system? <laughs> he's not Why coming to the same. He's not coming to the same conclusion that we did, but. 
we ended up do, we ended up taking the tag based system we, that we went with for different reasons, namely trying trying to trying to codify a set a set of a set of weapons for a template design was going to create problems. Mm -hmm. But we have, I would argue that our system is a little more customizable since we the tag system does allow you to personalize any weapon you've chosen mm -hmm. and your great weapon whatever or and versus your dueling weapon or your close weapon you can describe what that is however you'd like you could have a dueling dagger you could have a a, a punching knife as a dueling as a or as a dueling based weapon if it's big enough you could probably have a gauntlet sword for the, for all it for that for all that as mm -hmm. well and mm -hmm. The the other reason that I think we went with that with the approach that we did is we wanted to co accommodate for some of the more unorthodox weapons in Final Fantasy's canon. Because how else convergent? Are you gonna... <laughs> Go ahead. I was, I was going to say convergent cre uh, con con convergent creativity is a is a hell of a thing. Mm -hmm. So now when it comes to armor and stealth. Now, he, he has a quick rundown on how it's going to work, and he's going to make it pretty later. Sneaking puts Hinder 3 on you. If you your, so your sneak speed is, low, is slower than your move speed. Armor adds to the amount sneaking hinders you. If that would reduce your move speed to, ze to zero, you'd have to dash to sneak. If, even by dashing, you don't have enough movement to sneak, you can't sneak. This system makes extra sense since um, since Dex gives you your movement speed because sometimes, not always, I can be smart. Extra dev note: I only kind of remember writing this. It seems pretty smart. <laughs> it makes sense if you remember. Every uh, severity of hinder uh, reduces your um, your movement speed by, I believe, five feet. Yeah. Um, and let's not forget, a slower movement speed also means a slower budget for quick actions. Yep, and uh, and in that re in that respect, when you're hindered to the fullest amount of your of your movement speed, it is going to be when you actually can't move. But that's why dash uh, overcoming hinder was part of the hindered condition, and so. So you by by sneaking you automatically uh, lose fifteen feet of movement. Mm -hmm. And then each uh, and then armor adds an additional severity of hindered. So that makes sense. I like it. Mm -hmm. He's right that it do, that it did, did did seem pretty smart when he wrote it at the time. Um, I want. The dev note, the original dev note, to be by the, uh, the 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 grizzled rogue, and then the extra dev note to be by the younger the younger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I I want, I want the rogue to be kind of jaded about all this, and then Paladin to come in and go. I only kind of remember writing this, but it seems pretty smart. Yeah. That would be a great interplay. You know, have a bit, have a bit of a. Uh, this would this would probably be te this would probably be terrible, but um, there's a part there's a part of me that in the G in the GM section regarding assembling a party, that is the perfect that would be the perfect opportunity to do one of my favorite gags. Mm -hmm. I have one important question for you, Zan. Who's the oh. tank? <laughs> Me. <laughs> no, who is the tank? I don't know who's the tank. Exactly. But what about our what about our DPS? What's the DPS? No, what's the mage? Who's the tank? Well, where's the DPS? <laughs> uh, good old who's on first. Mm -hmm. Oh. But now for the light ar for the light armor the t once 
I think all the armors are going are going on that five tier setup, which we've kind of dipped in. We went when we went to classes, so. Eh, so at the at the start, now I'm, I'm, we're not going to go through all five tiers. We're just I think we're just going to go with the start and end, and end cap of each. Well, first mm -hmm. I'd like to note that the stealth penalty and the encumbrance stays the same on all five tiers. Mm -hmm. All light armor has an encumbrance of two and a stealth penalty of one, meaning you'd be hindered four. Yep. When sneaking with light armor on. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Incur we have so for um, for light armor, you start with no damage reduction and one deflection. At tier five, you get two damage reduction and three deflection. Very nice. Medium armor, you instead get you instead <laughs> get um. You instead, you instead get bonus hit points and deflection. Um, yep. I'm not sure. Um, why, not sure why it's just written as a number instead of a plus for that. Probably forgot it in part of the formatting. Probably. Um, this this uh, section is. I I'm I'm thinking a little bit more in progress than the classes section was. Mm -hmm. So, um, just as a side note, medium armor, all of them have a stealth penalty of two and an encumbrance of three. You gain five bonus hit points per tier. I'm curious if these bonus hit points are added to your total hit points, or if these are temp. I think that's I assume one that they're total. I assume that it's part of your total. Mm -hmm. um, tier one and tier two get one deflection, and then two, and then um, three and four get two, and then three for tier five. Then we have heavy armor, which also grants bonus hit points, but grant but instead of deflection, grants damage reduction. Has a stealth penalty of four and an encumbrance of four. That's a pretty steep stealth penalty. Mm -hmm. Makes sense though. Most heavy armor is pretty pretty bulky. You've been you've been in armor just as I have, so you know how you know what hell that is. I've been in full plate in the middle of the summer. So have I. It's not fun. No, it no, it isn't. It is when you're beating other people and taking out all your anger at the fucking sun <laughs> on them. Oh. What? But at at first tier you you get instead of instead of 5 per tier, your bonus hit points are 10 per tier. You ha you you'll have in at tier 1 and 2, you'll have one damage reduction. 3 and 4, you'll have two. And at fifth, you'll have three. And and like we said, four and four when it comes to stealth and encumbrance. With a dev note saying, heavy armor looks like it's effectively the most protective, and that's because it is. Though certain feats, light armor mastery, medium armor mastery, make the other armors more viable. We'll probably get to that when we get to feats. The balance is that most don't get access to heavy armor, so if you wanted it and heavy armor mastery a feat, that that would be then that would be two feats total. One for one for proficiency with heavy armor and one for heavy armor mastery. It all balances out. Gen general note: the encumbrance of armor increases by two if it is not being worn. So um, that would mean that heavy arm heavy armor that you're just carrying has an encumbrance of six. Which makes sense. Have you ever carried a suit of of plate armor that isn't on you? It's way worse than wearing it. It's kind of cheating, but I think the last time I did, I was carrying it by cart. My plate was packed in a small trunk. Which is more encumbering than wearing it on my body. Once again, we but. come to the difference between... At that he had mentioned beforehand between a between carrying a kayak and carrying a backpack. Yes. Armor is definitely one of those things that you'd rather just be wearing. Mm -hmm. Except when you don't want to suffer in the fucking sun! Yep. Let's see, then we have character levels in the scaling of armor. <clears throat> works, about, works about how you'd expect every... So tier one, one through three, tier two, four through six, then seven through ten, then eleven through fifteen, then sixteen through twenty. The assum 
I do hope this developer note on character on character levels and scaling is is brought in to the full book. The assumption is that the party might occasionally find one or two materials that are rarer than their current tier as the game progresses, so the levers here are different than other rarity scalings seen elsewhere for that reason. Because the 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 other level scalings are one through four, five uh five through eight, et cetera, et cetera, until it was seventeen through twenty at the end. And we also have we also have the time given for how long it takes to don and doff um armor. And so for I love the fact that, that Don and Doff are seen as archaic terms when it's literally just the word words on and off with a D attached. Mm -hmm. oh. Light armor, one minute each. Medium armor, five minutes to Don, one minute to Doff. Heavy armor, ten minutes to Don, five minutes to Doff. And a, a, light, a light shield, one minute each. A standard shield and a tower shield action each. A light shield take a minute to put on compared to a st just an action for a standard shield or tower shield. That doesn't that doesn't make sense. It's just strapped to your arm. Mm -hmm. Would it you doesn't take would, what? Do you think that do you think that any shield should just be an action to Don or Doff? Yeah, because light shields, like in in real life, and so this is verisimilitude. Verisimilitude, we're talking about here. Um, putting on a light shield, one that's just strapped to your arm, is as easy as buckling it, and that buckling is usually ten seconds round there. Standard shields, which are things like heater shields or tower shields. They have a strap and a handle, because you have to handle all that bulk. And they're just as quick to put on. It, there's there's no real difference. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like a minute is excessive. I assume an action in this game is, is 10 seconds, because I remember him mentioning an action, or 10 seconds if uh, action economy yeah. is not being tracked. But I, I could... I, I, suppose, I suppose one could argue it taking a minute for... Like a tower shield because those are big motherfuckers. But if you have to, if you have to pick it up off the ground, maybe. But if it's standing up, leaning somewhere, you just rug your arm through the two straps, grab the handle, and now it's on. Mm -hmm. Same with same with a heater shield. I uh, for those of you who don't know what a heater shield is, imagine a police badge the size of my arm. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's a it's a big boy. Yeah, of, cor of course, that... with of course with um tower shields. With a tower shield, you may as well be logging, may as well be lugging around a small log. <laughs> Most tower shields are the size of doors. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, uh, tall guy problems. Having a tower shield made for a tall guy means you have a heavier tower shield than everybody else. I've 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 wielded a tower shield in full plate armor before. It is a pain in the fucking ass. I really hope you didn't have to do it in formation. No, this was a this was large scale war, so it was a it was me. Um, so small SCA story for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was Landsknecht, um for anyone who knows what that is, and my terrible German. I uh, I apologize. Um, <laughs> and. I was in full plate, and we started as the shock troopers in that war. We we marched in formation for all of 30 seconds with tower shields and nine-foot spears. I didn't like my commander. He, he was very traditional in some of his stuff. But as everyone knows, Lanskinect are, uh, are mercenaries that are used for shock factor. They were literal shock troops. And uh, generally, that, ev ev that inevitably turned to them wielding big fuck-off swords and looking scary. Um, the Zweihander were very common material amongst uh, Landskrieg groups. So um, 
it is after we got a couple kills up on the enemy in our front that basically all of us were like fuck these shields dropped the shield i went two-handed on the spear because a nine foot spear is a big fuck off weapon and i still had a zweihander um belted to my hips so if i ever lost the spear i still had my big fuck off sword needless to say we did win um and our opponent really didn't like us <laughs> really did not like us can't imagine why I, I think it might be the fact that i started wielding the spear like someone trained in spear-based martial arts rather than a traditional spear fighting form from europe oh oh yeah we oh yeah we forgot we forgot about that a bunch of the a bunch of the people in that group were um were grog the sca is a bunch of fucking grogs mm -hmm. if you don't do sword and board you're not a real knight fuck you but uh yeah I, uh, I I started wielding that spear like you would see in, well, multiple different Eastern media. And uh, they didn't like the fact that I could extend a nine-foot spear 12 feet away from me. Well, 12 feet at the tip, they, because they my arms are long. Did they expect you to just stand and jab? I think they did. <laughs> they didn't expect me to sweep with a fucking spear. Especially not one nine feet long. You're not wielding a quarter staff. Doesn't fucking matter. I'm gonna take you off your feet, motherfucker. A spear is just a quarter. A spear is just a quarter staff with extra steps. <laughs> spear is what we call a danger quarter staff. <laughs> just like a venomous snake is a danger noodle. Mm -hmm. But but uh, rails now. Yeah. <laughs> but we do have an answer to the armor granting hit points. Some armors grant a character hit points. These hit points replenish either when a character resupplies or that character may use vitality when they push forward in order to replenish lost hit points granted by armor just as they would replenish their hit points normally. Dev note: This means that you can't just regain the hit points granted by armor by taking it off and putting it on again. I think he means to type that would be dumb, not that would be done. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. It does mean that if you carry a full extra suit of armor, that you can <laughs> that you can switch into it and regain the hit points that way. That's canon. It's also really encumbrancing to do so, but hey, I did think of that. <laughs> um, if somebody has the thing that would the thing that would make this especially dangerous is um, if somebody if somebody has a magic way to ha to have multiple types of armor. You have just you have, congratulations. You have just created both Iron Man and half a dozen common riders in one move. Uh, armor swapping. <laughs> you also you also created season 2 of the Iron Man cartoon. I've got a better idea, Monk. What? Create the world's first ablative armor. Give it an encumbrance of of nine, because it's light armor with medium armor on top with heavy armor on top of that. And as you lose armor hit points on the heavy armor, you purge it. Now you're in medium armor. The world's first ablative armor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm not. No, you are. No, you are. <laughs> so, then we get to shields, which come in three types. Quick and mobile light shields, typical standard shields, and heavy but defensible tower shields. You can only benefit from one shield at a time. Oh, no dual wielding shields, and must have proficiency with the shield in order to get any mechanical bonus from it. Let's see. Then first we have light shields, which is strapped to your arm. It is small so as to not tire out your now your now freed hand and provides lesser protection against its large than its larger cousins. So, while while wearing a light shield, your hand is considered to be free for the purposes of loading and ammunition requirements on weapons, somatic components for spells, or any action that requires a free hand to perform. 
You may not use this free hand to wield a weapon or support a weapon that requires two hands to wield, like a two-handed sword or a bow, but you may use it to load a sling or light crossbow, then fire them with your other hand, since they only require one hand to use. You may use your shield hand to throw a weapon with the thrown property. It takes one minute to secure or remove the shield from your arm and cannot be disarmed of it, nor can you drop it while it is equipped. That one minute thing we're still kind of iffy on. I think. Yeah, again, I, I've used light shields. Some people will say bucklers, but they don't actually understand what a buckler is. Um, that's actually a shield just held in your hand at the very end of your hand and is basically the size of a small saucer or a small dinner plate. Mm -hmm. And it's used for deflection and punching. Um, but I've used smaller round shields that are just strapped to your arm and leave your hand free. Um, they're not very common in, again, in real life, but this is a fantasy game. And, and the only verisimilitude I have an issue with is the whole strapping on taking a full minute. Because... I, even one with two straps that is more secure, you slip your arm through the straps, strap one down, strap two down, that's about 15 seconds. You're done. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're not in a stressful situation. Assuming that you're donning and doffing your equipment outside of a stressed situation such as combat, you just... Flip over the shield, put it on a flat surface, slip arm through, strap, strap. You're done. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, when it comes now, light shields, they start with a da with a damage threshold of four, and then cap at eight. Start with no deflection, then cap at three, and have an encumbrance of one, no matter no matter their tier. Mm -hmm. So then we get to standard shields. So they. Gr they grant a, these grant a physical defense increase instead of a damage threshold, um, starting at two and capping at three. They they have the they have the same relative rate of deflection as light shields, and have an encumbrance of two. Then tower okay. then tower shields, you have a few other rules. Your movement speed is reduced by five feet. You cannot wield the tower shield while mounted. It takes one action to secure or remove the shield on to or from your arm. While wielding the shield, and attack rolls you make with weapons that do not have the light property are considered improvised weapons. And these and this one also increases your physical defense. So it starts at two and cap and caps at three. You get you get a damage threshold instead of deflection which starts at 4 and caps at 8 and you have 3 encumbrance no matter no matter what with with tower shields indeed mm -hmm. let's see then we have weapons your class grants different proficiency types and various types of weapons reflecting both the class's focus and the tools you are most likely to use whether you favor a long sword or a long bow, your weapon and your ability to wield it can effectively can mean the difference between life and death while adventuring. The weapons table shows the most common weapons used in, in Mirari, their price and weight, the damage they deal when they hit, and any special properties they possess. Every weapon is classified as either melee or ranged. A melee weapon is used to attack a target within melee reach of you, generally 5 feet, whereas a ranged weapon is used to attack a target at a distance. Now for proficiency, um, yes, there are two types of proficiency. We've gone over this a lot with classes, simple and martial. Most classes can wield a bludgeoning weapon with simple proficiency. They take the blunted end and apply it as hard as they're able to the squishy part of an enemy. To wield a weapon with martial proficiency, however, is something else entirely. This understanding is represented in the damage dice associated with each weapon. A blade master and a farmer will not wield a sword in the same way, this is reflected in the weapon's damage dice. Proficiency of a certain type al allows you to add your proficiency bonus to the attack roll at for any attack you make with that weapon and use that weapon's damage, which corresponds to which type of proficiency you have. If you make an attack roll using a weapon which you lack proficiency, is considered an improvised weapon. 
if I use swords to plow shares, does that mean the blade master loses his uh, his um, bonus from proficiency and the farmer gains it? <laughs> um, I think that would be up, I think that would be up to the GM in that situation. I had to make that joke. Swords mm -hmm. to plow, plowshares was sitting there, too too good to pass. Yep. So then we have properties. <laughs> so we ha you have ammunition, self-explanatory, awkward. When you hit when you hit with an attack with an awkward weapon, that cre the, you do not add in any ability modifier into the damage of the weapon unless that ability modifier is negative. Instead, the creature may consider their ability modifier plus one to be the minimum roll of the weapon when rolling damage dice. In addition, if an awkward weapon has the heavy property, you have to use two hands. So I think I think in I think in other words you ha you have to rely solely on the you have a high you have a higher floor with the dice, but you're not getting more than that. Yeah. Let's see. Heavy. You're un you cannot wield heavy weapons in one hand effectively. You have disadvantage on attack rolls when it when you make an attack while wielding a heavy weapon in one hand. And you do not add your ability modifier to the attack roll or damage roll of a heavy weapon when wielding it in one hand. A heavy weapon size and bulk make it too large to be used in one hand effectively. Why am but I thinking are... of why am I thinking of certain um Souls game builds? <laughs> <clears throat> Dual ringed knight great swords in Dark Souls Three. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 sorry. I I didn't say that out loud. What are you talking about? Um, no. Uh, remember that there's a, that stance that allows you to use heavy weapons in one hand if uh, without the penalties of the heavy tag. I'm going to dual wield heavy weapons. It will happen. You'll see it, Tanner. It will happen. Oh, let's see. Light, light makes it ideal for use when with, when fighting with two weapons. Loading, because of the time required, you must spend a 10-foot quick action in addition to your action in order to load and fire it in the same turn. If a creature could take multiple attacks in a turn, they need only spend one quick action during their t during their turn to load the weapon for each of their attacks. Um, that'll, that will certainly make things interesting for the, for, for say the, um, for say the squad of crossbow wielding monks. They're, they're a defensive troop anyway. They're not meant to move. They're meant to shoot you from on high. Mm -hmm. Let's see then, ra um, range, a weapon that can be. So basically, the basically the range of the weapon. Dev note: the ranges in Heavens and Heresies are greatly reduced. There are ways in in the feats and classes to increase them, but the starting numbers are really low compared to other games. I think some people have an issue with this. I don't because it, because um it means that it means that you can't just be you can't just be a sniper out of the gate. If you want to be a sniper, you got to build to that. Also, let also let's be honest. Some, but um, if you pick, if you if if you were to, if you were to pick up if you were to pick up a full-on sniper rifle, you're not gonna be sh you're not gonna be shooting at um you're not gonna be shooting at over 500 yards. Just well, you well you and I might you and I might, but um the but the average Joe who isn't optimized isn't. Well, yeah, not to mention. You can't be a sniper out of the gate because you don't know the uh, the consecrated art of Jurati. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see, reach adds five feet, standard fare. Special, unusual rules. Thrown, you can throw the weapon to make a ranged attack. The range will be specified. Um, characters are assumed to recover all thrown weapons after an encounter. The weapons are not counted for this reason, and the encumbrance of weapons with the throne property include the encumbrance of the entire of the entire brace of weapons. And versatile, the weapon can be used with one or two hands. A damage value in parentheses appears with the property. I personally like that because 
In other cases, we've seen weapons that are that can be considered versatile, and all that versatile does is just gives you plus one to damage, which is kind of lame. Yep. If oh. if I am wielding a bastard sword in one hand, Wait. and then I wield that bastard sword in two hands, I am exerting much more force than before. Yeah, let's con let's consider for. I know I know a lot of people hate bleach, but um. I always end up. Th I always end up thinking of when um when Zor when Zoraki decides. You know what? I'm gonna try using two handed and and do this kendo thing I keep hearing about. <laughs> yeah. And and he's even more. I plead the fifth. Oh, see, then we have we uh, weapon categories, which is go which is going by type rather than a specific set of numbers for every single weapon in existence. <laughs> oh. and then we have weapon categories and subcategories. Some refer to an entire category or type, while others refer to smaller categories within that larger headings. Actually. Uh, Monk, I am going to read the opening to weapon categories here, because it's actually pretty important. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many different types of weapons, so much so that it makes more sense to organize weapons by type rather than give a specific set of numbers to every single weapon ex in existence. In most of the following weapon types, there are examples of the weapons which are associated with each type. These lists are far from exhaustive, but the goal is to attach you, adventurer, to your weapon. No adventurer just wields a blade. She wields a short sword she found on the body of a dead goblin after a horde of them raided her village. And not all swords look the same for that matter. Hers is old, but functional, a bit of gleam on the pommel from the oils on her hand as she continually checks to see that it rests in its scabbard. Mm -hmm. The point of formatting weapons is in this way is to force you, adventurer, to think about your weapon. This is your weapon. It may be a one-handed blade, but what kind? What does it look like? There are many one-handed blades, but this is yours. Make it so. Make it so, number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that I know that that's that, that was covered in uh, a lot of uh, Tanner's blurbs that you got from him prior to the to the uh, episode. But th this passage is quite important. Yes, the weapons are categorized by type because that's just better. It's more efficient. It's not limiting in any way it, and it also leaves everything else open to interpretation and that's the important part what type of sword do you have is this one-handed sword just a normal long sword is it a kopesh maybe it's a kopesh kopeshes are cool mm -hmm. oh what instead of go instead of going with a short sword why not go with an arming sword Yep. Or just a spaffa. Um. <laughs> yeah, the yeah you could you could do that. You could do that, but for ex for example, um, why not go? Um, instead instead of going with a instead of going with a long sword, <laughs> you, um. I heard, I mentioned it earlier, but why not a why not a gauntlet sword or a or or even even something like a like the big ass Ottoman sabers? <laughs> a scimitar. Mm -hmm. I have friends who still call them scimitars for no reason. I think they do that just to piss you off. No, th this guy has said scimitar since he was five and never tried to change it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um. I tell them, say scissors. It says scissors. And then I go, say scimitar. Hilarity ensues. It doesn't piss me off. It makes me laugh. <laughs> Does that make me a bad person? Maybe. <laughs> there are many things that make... There are, 
That is a debatable affair. Oh. But... So for so so when it comes to when it comes to axes we ha we have we have axe we start off with axes chop chop go the axe it's expertise feat axe mastery they a attacks with our axes target strength defense and they have plus one to threat range the subcategories are throwing axes light axes one handed axes and great axes. And the the versatile example in this, um, if you're doing simple damage, that's 1d6 or 1d8. If you're doing martial damage, that's 1d8 or 1d10. And gr great axes have mar have a martial damage of 1d12. So, for all of you out there wondering, what's the difference between a throwing axe, a light axe, and a one-handed axe? Because great axe pretty much explains itself. Mm-hmm. I will give you an example. If you want a throwing axe, go look up Getter Robo Tomahawk. If you want a light axe, go look up Getter Robo G Tomahawk. If you want a one-handed axe, look up Shin Getter Dragon Tomahawks. And for great axe for good measure, look up Shin Getter Tomahawk. Yes, this all relates to Mecha, but... All of those tomahawks are different fucking sizes, and they all wreck shit. Should we be thankful that there isn't a tomahawk for the Getter Emperor? There is. Oh. It was oh, just shit. never animated. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just that's the kind of thing that would probably be exterminatus waiting to happen. Then again, everything about Getter Getter Emperor is exterminatus waiting to happen. Monk, did you forget that Shin Getter and Shin Getter Dragon cut Jupiter in half with a giant Getter Tomahawk? No, I did not. Oh. Okay, so if Shin Getter and Shin Getter Dragon, which are smaller than a planet, can do that, of course Getter Emperor, which eats planets for breakfast, can do that. Mm -hmm. Although I would, but we I digress. Wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind seeing a death battle between Getter Emperor and um, Unicron. Getter Emperor wins, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. So next we have blades. They can slash and poke. Their expertise feat is blade mastery. Attacks with blades target constitution defense. And when wielding a blade type weapon, your deflection increases by one. This bonus does not stack for each additional blade you are wielding. So no Roranor Zor Zoro here. <laughs> oh. Especially, especially during those moments when he when he had all of the arms and thus all of the swords. But you have throwing blades, light blades, one-handed blades, and great blades. That couldn't be called a sword. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> More a raw slab of iron, in fact. <laughs> um, and the, it's uh, it is amusing that um, throwing blades can do piercing or slashing. I think. I'll, well, I, if, go ahead. There, there are two ways you can throw blades. You and I should know this. There's the underhanded method, which usually throws it point point first in a straight line. Then there's the overhead method which throws it in a whirling circle. So yeah, a thrown blade can be both piercing and slashing. Mm -hmm. So then we have <clears throat> bows and slings, like crossbows, but you need stats. It is interesting that they're put in the same cat that they're put in the same category, but as somebody who's used a sling, I can understand that. Oh. And they tar they target dexterity defense. So let so you can have light ranged light ranged weapons, um, light bows and heavy bows, and slings and bow gun and blow guns would count as light ranged. Um, so you need ammunition. It's light loading and and has range. 
Um, so the and the highest at the highest at a martial level you can do with bows is one d eight. Let's see, then we have the cro then we have crossbows. Foolproof doesn't even need stats. Crossbow expert is its expertise feat. They target dexterity defense. Let's see, le so we have light crossbows, crossbows, and heavy crossbows. And a dev note. For some reason, I had removed light crossbows as a subcategory, but at this moment, I can't figure out why I did that. It was probably for an important reason, but I honestly can't remember it, so I've added it back into the game. There was a lot of game here for my brain to keep track of. Don't we know it? <laughs> but heavy crossbows at martial level can do 1d12 damage. Although they do have the disadvantage of at the higher tiers, they do have the disadvantage of awkward, so it's not like you're going to be doing. No, all three. No. All three yeah. crossbows have the disadvantage of awkward. It's just that heavy crossbows also have heavy, meaning you have to use two hands. You have to use two hands, and you're not going to be able to apply stats to them. Which then yeah. again, which, which then again, he he already warned about with don't even need stats. But I do like this since this since this means that, um, in a lot of in a lot of games, there's not there's not enough difference between bows and crossbows. Whereas he, whereas here, there's a there is a clear difference. And well, in mo in most games that have higher ranges, the difference is ranges. Yeah, but when you consider how how co how combat and how combat ends up playing out, that that kind of difference isn't going to be felt as much. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have flails, because flails are awesome. It's like death on a string, on a stick. So flail mastery is the expertise feat. They can target either constitution or strength defense, your choice when you make the attack. So it's either light flails, one-handed flails, or great flails. Which range from 1d4 at light sim at light simple to 1d12 at great martial. Um, which of these three categories do you think a meteor hammer would fall into? Um, probably a one-handed flail. I was going to say, um, <clears throat> I guess Ness. Um, Wields light flails. <laughs> They're yo-yos. Yeah. They're light flails. Yeah, they are. Let's see, and then mass weapons, smashy bashy. The expertise feat is fell handed. Mass weapons target constitution defense, and they can ignore up to three points of damage reductions when they hit a threat. So, so this would be your hammers and your maces and such. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And, the, and pole arms, pokey slashy from range, speak, speaking of which. Um, pole arms target dexterity defense. And they have a reach they have a reach of ten, they have a 10 foot reach, which is certainly interesting because a lot of times when we see pole arms and quarterstaffs and the like, they only have a five foot reach. No, I think he means that's your total reach. Cause he cause earlier when we read reach, um, it said this weapon adds five feet to your reach when you attack with it, as well as determining your reach for opportunity attacks with it. Fair point. Since you are So I'm pretty sure that just means that's your total reach. Your total reach is ten feet. Yeah. Um I think I think I think heavy pole arms would be the would be the big ass halberds. Mm-hmm. Oh. Was... I mean, we we could we could argue that the shin getter, um, the shin getter tomahawk could also technically be a heavy pole arm, considering it's taller than shin getter is. Oh. Then we have special weapons, only for the most special snowflakes. Their expertise feats are Trapper and Unarmed Mastery, respectively, because we're dealing with Nets and Unarmed Strike. Um, 
Attacks with nets target strength defense, and attacks with unarmed strike target constitution defense. Tanner, when you were writing Heavens and Heresies, were you watching Spartacus? <laughs> Asking for a friend. And net nets don't deal damage, but instead inflict degrees of hindered. And of course has no effect on creatures that are formless or creatures that are huge or larger. A creature can use an attack to attempt to free itself from the net. The net has physical defenses of 10 and is destroyed when hit. Damaged nets may be repaired when you push forward. You may carry multiple nets, but each net has an encumbrance score of 1 against your carrying capacity. A critical hit with a net inflicts 2 severity of hindered. 2 additional for two a total additional. of 3. Mm -hmm. Well... So for so in that in that case the um, a critical hit with a net for simple would be four, and five for martial. Yes. And well, arms. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. I was just looking at that again. Mm -hmm. And unarmed strikes deal the are light bludgeoning bludgeoning attacks that deal either one d four or one d six damage. And then we have spell foci. These and I, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to uh, argue just a moment here with Tanner. Unarmed strikes follow the same rules as any other weapon, though you cannot be disarmed. Oh, contraire, mon, mon frere, <laughs> you absolutely can be dis. Armed. <laughs> Tis but a <I'm>... scratch. <laughs> no, it's not. Your arm's off. But I'm sure there's a wound severe enough in the wounds category that would mean your arm is now gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then we have spe then we have spell folk, eh? These entries are new. He'll put more description on them later. Pretty, pretty much these are what allow you to get access to these spell foci options when you know a spell. So you have a light spell focus, a one-handed spell focus, and a two-handed spell focus. Um, light spell focus doesn't have any additional properties. A one-handed has plus one to spell attack rolls. And a two-hander has plus one to threat range for spell attacks. So you're telling me that my Inquisitor, who can use weapons as spell foci, um, wielding a polearm, has plus one to threat range with his spell when he's using that spell on a, on a weapon attack? If that's the case, that's certainly in keeping with the Inquisitor. Attention, citizen! Die! <laughs> I know that's Arbides, but I don't care. Um, let's see, then we have arms and armor kits. So basically, maintenance kits for weapons and armor. Uh, so one, with the weapon maintenance kit, once while you have this kit in your inventory, you may re-roll the damage you would deal from a weapon attack and take the higher of the two rolls. You may also give the benefits of this kit to another creature, but each kit may only give its benefits to one creature at any given time. You regain all expended uses of this kit when you resupply or rest. Let's see, an arm armor maintenance kit. Um, you can re you can have a creature reroll the damage it would deal it would deal from a weapon attack and take the lower roll, as if you were wearing as long as you're wearing armor or a shield. You may also give the benefits of this kit to another creature, but each kit may only give its benefits to one creature at any given time. Dev note: the narrative logic here is that if you have a kit that allows you to take extra care of your stuff, allowing you when you need to, to sacrifice it a little bit to protect yourself slash deal more damage without completely breaking it. Oh. Basically, whenever you finished using your blade, you take out your little dust ball and hammer... Oh, wait, no, we're, we're not that weeb. Is, is, is it just me? Little dust ball and hammer, check for the resonance of the blade? <laughs> Might just be me. Oh. Okay. Then we have potions. See, first off, as as is put, um, as long as a character has a potion or poison in their inventory, they're able to use that potion or poison after each resupply. Characters are assumed to refill their potions and poisons 
resupply during periods of rest without needing to explicitly say they are doing so. Some groups might decide to actively describe how they are refilling their potions and poisons. Gerardi. <clears throat> I'm going to read this next part. <laughs> For example, a player might describe their character, Namdoodle Boondiggity the Gnomish Alchemist, as continuously chewing on a strange herb, occasionally spitting the chew into a vial, and using this as the justification for why Nam Doodle's healing potions are refreshed when he takes a period of rest or resupply. That's I just I just wanted to read Nam Doodle's <laughs> name. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. The narrative explanation is always encouraged as it makes each character more interesting and unique, but is not always required and should be used as a way to include one, include oneself in the narrative rather than a box to check in order to refill one's items. Like other items, potions are categorized by tier, ranging from 1 to 5, and cost an associated amount of currency. Each individual potion or poison has an encumbrance of 1. Bold dev note. Why do potions like this? Hello, it's your beautiful and illustrious dev here. You might ask, why though? Why not just buy potions and track each one that you have individually? It's what other games do. And you are smart to ask this question. Or more accurately, I am smart for asking it for you. The answer is simple. That method is awesome. Awful. awful. <laughs> that, that method is awful. awful. Like eating hair off the ground of a public restroom. Awful. That's an oddly specific example, Tenor. I think he was just thinking of the most gross thing he could think of at the time. If you wanted the most gross thing you could think of, you could have just you could have just put in um you could you could have just put in um Eating, eating, ch eating day-old chitlins. Actually, no. Take I take it back. Tanner might be too white for that. Stop. Yeah, he's only saying it because he's black. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, chitlins are disgusting. Uh, I... Stop reminding me that they exist. I have to be reminded every year, so you have to be reminded too. I don't have to be reminded of shit. I don't live in your family. <laughs> in all seriousness, that method dis dis requires a great deal of bookkeeping for systems which have crafting, which this system has. It also runs the risk of forcing a GM to balance the game more than is necessary. How many potions can the party stockpile? What are their limits? What do I, when do I let them restore their wares? When do I give them potions? How do I let them manipulate the potions I give them? These questions aren't easy a lot of the time, especially for new GMs. These types of systems also tend to include potions and poisons as an afterthought. Players cannot engage with their mechanics unless the GM explicitly adds them to their game. The effects of my potion mechanics are simple. Players and GMs have an established way they use potions, receive them, and can manipulate them. A GM is not forced to balance this aspect of the game with how many potions they give out, and players can reliably have access to potions which are, let's face it, fun to use in a fantasy setting. Granting reliable access to potions and their effects also has another benefit. I am able to disrupt, in a fun way, the we-need-a-dedicated-healer mentality. I agree with this. With this mechanic, any player can help the party survive, and more importantly, that role can switch fluidly throughout the course of the adventure. For one encounter, maybe the fighter is the potion mule, but the fluidity of the system means that he need not remain so, and the party can transfer their potions to another character if the situation demands. Also, as an aside, there is a whole section on alchemy and the potions slash poisons therein in the artistries. So just assume this explanation is for those two. And we'll get to artistries on a, at another time. Mm -hmm. So we have, the re we have the rejuvenation potions. Some potions are relatively easy to procure. Healing potions, for instance. These potions can be made by most people and are readily sold by apothecaries within the lands of Mirari. Like most items, potions have a quality which is bound to their currency cost. Within the narrative, any per player is able to purchase, craft, and utilize these base potions. The potions listed here are single use. Once they are used, the character cannot use them again until they resupply. The only way to grant oneself multiple uses of the same potion is to have multiple copies of that potion. And there's a sidebar here uh, with Aaron asking a question. Um, meta question, is Mirari a high magic setting? That is the vibe I am getting. Tanner responds, kinda. Magic is everywhere, but the extent of what it can accomplish is limited. 
Like normal types of sickness aren't really a problem, but magical sicknesses are. Also, normal people might know a cantrip or some such, and it wouldn't be too out of place. The goal for the setting was to make sure both player and GM understood that magic was a part of the setting, as it is in D&D, but people tend to forget that, to reduce the issue of your character wouldn't know that spell exists nonsense, or other such nonsense. But then again, I've always been of the opinion that forcing a GM or a player to pretend that they don't know a mechanic is just bad game design and encourages people to not know the rules. Uh, the Monster Manual is a good example. GMs who say, you can't know the creature stats, or even you as a wizard wouldn't know what a paladin can do, just encourage the players to not read the mechanics of the game, which leads to a bunch of people around the table with no idea how the game is supposed to work because the, that would be, quote, metagaming. So to counter that, I made magic a part of the normal world, and the classes too, and gave the setting a narrative reason why everyone would know, in general, what each class can do, because it will make better players and GMs and experiences overall. This provides. I like this. This this, this is good, and it also provides a nice little middle finger to the to the magic attitudes of grogs. Hmm. We love grognards. Cough. Lying through his teeth. <laughs> cough, cough. Cough, cough, cough. Oh. Now, with, now with rejuvenation potions... Um, what... There's a few things that I find... In, a few things I find interesting. One, um, different means on how they can be created. And two, the rule setup. A character may drink a, re a rejuvenation potion as a 20-foot quick action... Administer it to an unconscious ally as an action, or allow a conscious ally to use it if they use a 10-foot quick action, and that ally expends their reaction. A character must drink all the potion at one time and cannot partition the healing it grants. The effects of the potion last for an encounter. Threats cause their effects to prolong, to pr um, prol prolong themselves. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a word. In the bodies of the adventurers, but they they affect it, but otherwise have a duration of one minute. They have note. I'm not sure if I've written yet, but if someone survives an encounter, everyone comes back with one hit point. Yeah, you did. Oh. So for each tier, you gain. So at tier one, using a potion, a com which cost which has a common cost, he gives ten temp HP. And it goes up five more for... No, it doesn't go five more. At second tier, it's 15, then 25, then 35, then 50. And this is intended to work with the Life Vessels features. And if you want to remember what the Life Vessels feature is that he's specifically referencing, seventh level feature, Potent Vigor, when a creature within 30 feet of you gains temporary hit points... You may also gain temporary hit points equal to half the amount rounded up as that creature. And, of course, uh, Arbiter of Life, when you were a creature within 30 feet of you, gains temporary hit points. You may increase the amount of temporary hit, po hit points they gain by an amount equal to half your level rounded up, plus your resolve modifier. And whenever you are a creature within 30 feet of you gains hit points, you may increase the amount of hit points they gain by your resolve modifier. Mm -hmm. So... Drinking a potion is a gain of temporary hit points. And since it's a gain of temporary hit points, Vessel goes, ooh, I get temporary HP, and you get more temporary HP. Now then we get to magical items. Does he have a spiel about that? Let's see. During your, during your adventures, you might encounter special magical items which grant unique features. In order to utilize such items, a character must attune to them, acclimating to their magical powers over a period of rest. While attuned, you are then able to utilize the effects of these items. A character may also remove their attunement to a magical item during a period of rest, and may, and may attune to or remove their attunement from multiple magical items during the same period of rest. The maximum number of magical items which, which a character may be attuned to at any given time is determined by their intuition modifier. So, it starts at one, it starts at at the at the bare minimum. You have one attunement slot. You gain one. You gain one for every two points above zero. So at for, at plus one and plus two, you have two slots. 
plus three and plus four, you have three slots. Plus, fi plus five, you have four slots. And at plus six or above, you have five slots. And you'll notice that uh, he mentioned special magical items which grant unique features. Features is a word... Gen like, feature <laughs> is used separately from the word feet mm -hmm. in many cases. Um, feet says it's as it's as it's a uh, as a term has its own section, but feature has always been used when referencing class features. So, if I remember correctly, last time I talked to Tanner about stuff like this, magical items were the way to get actual class features. Mm -hmm. Was there anything in the the stuff he wrote to you that talks about magical items? Yes, there was. Let me get to that. There was also there was also some stuff about um po about potions and cons and um consumables, but a lot of that we we are we more or less covered. Okay. So So what he wrote for what he wrote for uh, magic items was So for this part there won't be much on the actual doc, but I can give you some behind the scenes reasoning for the way I run magical items here as well as a few other cool bits and pieces. So magical items are the way you mechanically multi-class in Heavens and Heresies. Magical items are items that give minor variations of class features. Your intuition mod determines how many you can attune, so in a way. Your intuition is your ability to multi-class or gain features from other classes. Some example items might be a weapon that banishes on hit from the Paladin's Banish, or an item that grants you access to a specific druid aspect, or one that allows you to expend a vitality and utilize the fighter's move command. Things like this. The main thing to keep in mind with magical items is that they're supposed to be, for the most part, randomly rolled. They mm -hmm. aren't supposed to be players, things players can count mm -hmm. on to work into a build by design. Rather, they're supposed to be odd little hiccups that can provide some utility in certain situations, or be sold for something less unique but more necessary to the moment. No build requires a mechanical item in order to work. Looking at you, Holy Avenger. They instead increase the flexibility of a character, which is why they're tied to intuition. This doesn't mean that a GM can't throw a specific magical item they want into, to see into a game, but it should mean that players can't make slash create magical items for a specific build. In the narrative, magical items are odd little pieces of equipment that contain some sparse remnants of their owner's soul. Magical items only come from marked souls and, at least in my setting, cannot be effectively produced. There are also typical magical items. Swords that do fire damage, well, actually they grant the user the fire spell, as long as they use the weapon focus aspect of that spell, but same difference. Or rings that would give you a tier of expertise in a specific skill, though a requirement for those is that you already have proficiency. Stuff like that. Heavens and Heresies has another way of making items special, however. I always hated in some games how you would, you would hear the legendary sword of whoever, and then go on this epic quest to find to find it, and it would be like a plus two sword or something. Gee, why does that sound familiar? That doesn't fit the fantasy at all, not in a narrative or mechanical level. So in Heavens and Heresies, just, li just like characters can have reputations and the like, which have mechanical effects, so too can items. Meaning that Legendary Sword would have a legendary reputation, which it would grant to whoever is wielding it. For me, this was just as this was as big of a this was a big deal as it offered a way to make legendary items feel legendary, because weapons are legendary because of the stories behind them more than what they might be physically. But with this mechanic, I was able to make it palpable a palpable feeling in game. If you were wielding Soul Ripper, the blood sword of of Letares the Duelist, you are able to utilize the reputation of that sword. People know it, fear it. And those effects appear in-game in a system that is set up, or will be. I'm currently streamlining the reputation system, but it's almost there, for the GM, and doesn't force the GM to put in extra work to make legendary items feel legendary. And... This is... This is one. This is one of those things where I hope... Where... I think if I think if we didn't have that note, we would we probably would have been a little unsatisfied. Um, I wouldn't have been because I had been slightly discussing magical items with Tanner prior to this. Mm -hmm. We'd we'd had a little bit back and forth, and he did discuss how it would be a way to 
functionally fit in sm uh, small class features here and there. That, with what we already know about the classes and the ethos behind them, that each class is important, no class can work just by itself as one person. It does, you know, getting through adventures requires multiple people, and every class dynamically and fundamentally changes how a session will play. Having a feature from another class on whatever class you're playing, for example, my the Inquisitor that I'm really looking at, um, getting a feature from, say, Wizard to change one spell feed, just one spell feed, like it doesn't give you the one to change every spell feed ever, but like during a period of rest you could change one spell feed. That would probably be a very rare uh, magical item in, mm -hmm. in tier, considering this tier system. But that right there, that's gigantic for an Inquisitor. That's huge! So knowing that the possibility was there, um, that was something I had I had been just tumbling over in my mind. Mm -hmm. The addition about legendary sword of so-and-so just being a plus two great sword of of uh of smiting <laughs> which yes i have uh i've run one too many times into those situations instead now being a way to affect your reputation that legendary sword of so-and-so may actually have some good effects to it too you never know the 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 sword of the of the duelist the 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 blood sword of the duelist could actually have a really cool effect on it too, but the but the thing that you're getting from it is that you are holding the sword of a legendary being, and everybody knows that sword, and everybody's afraid of it or in awe of it or whatever, and so now that affects your fundamental role play interaction with numerous NPCs across the game. That's an additional that we hadn't discussed, and I'm actually happy he put in. So for me, my baseline was already at, this is going to be a really interesting mechanic, depending on how everything manifests, and now it's up to, okay, even better. Although when, although when it comes to mentioning um, legendary swords in that regard, and, that, and, that, and the reputation setup, what instantly came to mind is the Sorceress Sword Index. <laughs> Especially everyone's favorite sword, the Knight's Lament. <sighs> you know, the wu <laughs> I was going to say the Wuxia equivalent to the One Ring. I know. Until uh, until yeah. it ended up coming across a a wielder even more crazy. Crazy. I was crazy once. <laughs> oh. Now the last piece in there is the carts and vehicles thing, but I'm skipping over I'm skipping over that because simply because of the fact that it's very clearly a work in progress. He even says as much. Mm-hmm. But it does seem that this is going to be the main way that you're going to be able to do a expansion to your carrying capacity, as well as the, as well as resupplies. But pulling the thing is going to have its own encumbrance. Yep, gonna need a horse or something. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a tiny man cart, then you're turning into well, one of those Vietnamese cart drivers. But as far as, as far as equipment goes. Um, I think the I think the I think the big hi I think the big highlights are go are going to be are go for, that we take away from this is the weapon and armor system, as well as the materials. Yes, they're it's very clear that they're going to be extensive and ubiquitous without the system, um, especially since materials are your currency as well. This also this also means that GMs can't do can't do the whole can't that um the amount the amount of GP that might be that might be in in a um in a sack that you that you get as a reward isn't as important as the as the um t as the tier of it. Yeah, a sack of gold might be a an uncommon compared to the sack of silver being common. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's even assuming that silver is the standard. If if gold if gold is if gold is the standard, it might get knocked even lower. True. Uh, this of course also means that we don't have to deal with any rule of one hundred things when it comes to currency setups. Hmm. Uh, and in the pro in the process, it also means that um, that GMs can get a little bit more creative with the with the rewards. Uh, yeah. Um, on top of all that, uh, because there is a system in place that gives a recommended number of materials or, or loot or whatever to get mm -hmm. in an encounter, um, many GMs can avoid being either a Scrooge or a Monty Hall. Yeah. Um, I would, and I, I know that this one, this one is a little bit more raw than some of the other entries we've looked at. Um, the main thing that I would I would advise expand I would advise expanding upon is things like adventuring kits, potions, and magical items. Sim that's simply because there's already there's already the framework when it comes to kits. But I do, th but I do think I do think some more. I do think putting the kits into context and into practice is something that's necessary. I'd also like to see more on poisons. Mm -hmm. um, I know there was some mention of poisons in the class documents, and there's also, you know, mentions of poisons here. But I, I definitely want to see. What all sorts of poisons we have? Are the are the poisons also going to be based on the resonance of the materials that you use to create them? Probably, or, but or I think. But, I think them? but that's one of those things that is gonna, that we're going to need to hear the final word on that. On that, I have a. And they're probably that's... more in the alchemy ritual, or yeah. uh, artistry. Excuse me. Some some of these might in, some of these might end up being in artistries, which we're not going to get to for a bit. In fact, let me ch let me check my, let me check the so next week. Next week is all is going to be all about spells. Oh boy! And remember, guys, this game only actually has sixteen spells. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be all about those tasty, tasty secondary spell effects and how far customization can really go. Yep. Oh. Um. I've been looking forward to this actually. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, if everything go, I was gonna say if everything goes as planned, but then I remembered. All oh, right, Christmas Eve is on is on a Friday. This is true. Oh, and New and so is New and so is New Year's Eve. So, I'm not gonna say that we're gonna get through all of chat all of um part three, done in the in the month of December, but we're gonna get we're certainly gonna get some headway. Yeah. So there, so there's cer there's certainly going to be that to look forward to, and of and of course, um, to, and of course tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing one of my one of my favorite brothers from Argentina, and on Sunday we get we get to talk of, we get to talk about Toku in a different sense, so there's going to be that to look for, to look forward to as well as a few other as well as a few other things, but until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>